about 50 years. Richard and Honor's Tower and Pleasure has waited on my call. Nor does any earthly blessing appear to have been wanting to my felicity. This is a quote from the ruler of 10th century Spain, Abdel Rahman III. Anything he could have asked for, he got. He then goes on to say, I have diligently numbered the days of which pure and genuine happiness have fallen to my lot. They amount to 14. Satisfaction is defined as the pleasure derived from the fulfillment of one's expectations or wishes. Abdel Rahman had several expectations and wishes, and these were all equally fulfilled. After all, he was a ruler. But clearly there's something missing, because he said he was unhappy, even after having all of this money, power, fame, privilege. He was rich, he was powerful, and he was unsatisfied. I think there are two parts to dissatisfaction. One is the general lack of uh, discontent to the state of one's life, and the other is a lack of pleasure after achieving a goal. It's important to understand both elements, and I'll be going over why we feel either one and their ideas. To start, in the beginning of sophomore year, I had several goals. I wanted to get good grades, I wanted to join many clubs, and I wanted to do as many extracurricular activities as possible. When I got good grades, it pleased me at first, but after a while, I wasn't feeling as satisfied. Even worse, when I got lower grades, it made me feel worse than when I used to receive those grades on a regular basis. At first, I was involved in many clubs, and I was regularly attending those meetings. But I didn't feel much pleasure in being in clubs I didn't even want to be in. Another example is from my dad. He recently received a promotion for his job. He told me that he had been wishing for that for a long time. And when he finally got it, he was really happy. But his happiness only lasted for a few days. He had more money, he had respect, and he had a greater seat of authority in the company. So why was he dissatisfied? The reason for this comes from the concept of extrinsic versus intrinsic motivation. Extrinsic motivation is because of how people will perceive you or some external factor, which often ends up being money or power. Intrinsic motivation, on the other hand, is for your own sense of betterment and uh, self-worth. Research has shown that if your goals are extrinsically motivated, then you won't be as satisfied as if they're intrinsically, intrinsically motivated. So my dad's goals, well, his goal of getting a promotion was extrinsically motivated. Notice that money, respect, and authority are all external factors. As for myself, I was, uh, I was trying to be a good student for other perceptions of me. And I was doing work for the sake of doing work. Not because I really wanted to. Compare this to a marathon, com compare this to a runner who just completed his first marathon. This milestone is often intrinsic. It's something he works hard for, and he does it for his own sense of betterment. There's nothing extrinsic associated with this. So I would like for you to think about the goal you recently achieved. It could be anything, something as simple as planting a, a something planting a plan in your garden. And think about were your, motiv were your motivations for this goal extrinsic or intrinsic? And were you actually satisfied after completing that goal? I think it's important to understand the importance of extrinsic versus intrinsic motivation and how that relates to satisfaction. The second part of satisfaction, a general discontent for one's own life, is a little more broad and at times more dangerous. It goes something like this. My life isn't good enough. 
we feel that something is missing from our lives. And we think that if we solve that problem, we will be immensely happier. A lot of this comes from comparing ourselves to others. We think that we're not as successful as others, or as smart as others, or as attractive as others. Social media fuels this. Feelings of sadness and envy arise, and we feel dissatisfied. Imagine that you're feeling lonely, and you think that you don't have many friends. This is something most of us have felt at some point, but why is that? Most of us do have someone or multiple people who want to reach out or talk to us, but we feel that this isn't good enough for us. The reason for this is because we get used to them. Talking to them becomes the norm. This is known as hedonic adaptation. Hedonic, and hedonic adaptation is defined as when people acclimate to positive developments in their life and thus do not enjoy them as much. After a positive event, this slowly becomes a norm for us, and our pleasure of this event uh, decreases. So discouraged, we turn out attempts to hang out, and slowly the friends we do have will stop reaching out. Another example for students is the bad grade. Everyone has received a bad grade in the past. And most of us know the feeling of feeling sad, lethargic, and depressed after receiving this. And going on the downward spiral of studying less to the next test and getting back lower and lower grades. This is something known as negativity bias. Even though we've received good grades in the past, or we have good grades in other classes, we, uh, we focus on the bad. Negativity bias is a common cognitive bias to register negative events more readily. We focus on the bad and overlook the good in our lives. This is the centerpiece of dissatisfaction. It makes us feel as if we're not good enough, when in reality, we're on the right track. I promise you that your low feelings of self-esteem either in a certain topic or in general, are the result of small perfections that your brain identifies as huge issues. And to get rid of these feelings, you have to feel grateful. For example, for the student, they can think about the classes they're doing well in or the good grades they've received in the class in the past. Or they can think about how much access to education they have through the internet and books or maybe even how good of a tutor they have. When we're lonely, we can appreciate the friends we do have, the people who we talk to on a regular basis. Feel grateful for having these friends, and think about the moments you've had with these friends in the past. Gratitude makes you directly focus on what is good in your life instead of taking it for granted. And there are a number of positive effects associated with this, as proof a number of research papers. For example, there's a guy who strengthens neural pathways in our brain, which are related to feelings of reward, form of social bonds, and interpreting emotions. There are physical effects, such as an increased uh, likelihood to be healthier and better sleep. In terms of mental health, Gratitude is directly uh, negatively correlated with depression, and it makes us feel more optimistic. It, makes us, it gives us a positive outlook on life. Finally, for satisfaction, gratitude is associated with job, relationship, uh, school, and gender of life satisfaction. Again, that's proved by a number of research studies. Gratitude makes us feel better. So feeling grateful is a relatively fluffy topic. What are some objective ways we can feel more grateful? Well, a simple one is to just smile more or say thank you more. When we appreciate people, it makes them feel better and makes us feel better too. Uh, adding on to this, you can just add write messages or letters to people who you appreciate and let them know that you appreciate them. When you say thank you, you truly mean it. 
You can also volunteer. Volunteering has been proved by research to um, have uh, increased likelihood for you to feel grateful. It makes you feel grateful for things you may take for granted after seeing uh, the conditions of people who need the volunteering. And volunteering, um, uh, when, when you actually volunteer to help people, it makes you feel grateful. Another tactic is mental subtraction. This is uh, imagining life without a certain positive event. Think about things you might be uncomfortable without, or recent positive successes in your life. Finally, my favorite is a uh, gratitude journal. This is strongly backed by science. The premise is to write three things each day about something you're grateful for. It may sound a little silly, but stick with me on this. It can be anything. Something as simple as how, uh, what, some, what someone has done for you, or how much you like coffee. Gratitude journals show measurable improvements in well-being in just a few weeks. What about you? Can you think of something you're grateful for? I can start. I'm grateful for having the opportunity to give this talk and for your attention. And I hope that with these tactics, you won't have to number the days of pure and genuine happiness like the veneer of 10th century fame. Thank you.